welcome back, everyone. Um, so glad you're here with us today. Uh, we have about 7,200 registrants from 135 countries joining us. So really happy to have you in the audience with us for this final day of ISOJ. So before we get started with our next panel, I'd like to share just a few notes and also give a big shout out and special thanks to the Knight Foundation and Google News Initiative for sponsoring this year's ISOJ. I also wanna remind everyone that this panel will be simultaneously interpreted into Spanish. Um, so if you click on the globe icon in Zoom and you select the Spanish channel, you'll be able to listen in via Spanish. Um, and if at any point you have trouble with Zoom, you can always tune in via YouTube in English and Spanish instead. And we will have the links to those YouTube pages in the Zoom chat for you to access. So we're now going to turn our attention to today's panel titled Race and Equity in the News, Reporting and Service of Communities and with the URL, Uplift, Respect and Love Lens. And I think that that's actually my favorite title of all of this year's ISOJ sessions and I'm really looking forward to this panel. Um, it's going to be led by Sarah Lomax Reese, who is president and CEO of WURD Radio, Pennsylvania's only African-American owned talk radio station. So she'll be joined by four talented journalists who will talk about how they're each covering race and equity through a respectful and inclusive lens. So I'm sure those of you in the audience are going to have a lot of questions. So please post those in the chat and we'll get to them uh, at the end of the conversation. And you can also tweet highlights using the hashtag ISOJ2021. Now with that, let's get started. Hi, I'm Sarah Lomax Reese, and I am the co-founder of the URL Media Network, as well as the CEO and president of WURD Radio in Philadelphia. And I'm so excited to have the opportunity to talk to you all about URL Media Network and the work that we are doing to empower black and brown owned and led media organizations um, in partnership with my co-founder, Mitra Kalita, who is going to walk through this, uh, this brief presentation before we introduce some of our amazing partners to have a, a powerful conversation about race and equity in the news and how we as uh, media organizations of color empower, uplift, respect, and love, which is what URL stands for, how we do that for our individual communities and as a collective. Hey, Mitra. Hey, Sarah. Good to be here with you. So do you want to um, jump in? Sure. So um, I think it's worth rewinding a little bit, Sarah, and kind of talking about our own backgrounds. We're both, um, we're not only co-founders of this network, but we're also members. Um, and Sarah and I have known each other for a few years. Um, when we were talking about URL before it was URL, it felt like we were facing a big problem uh, that required a big solution, but we didn't want to sacrifice what each of us um, as individual entities represent to our communities. And so having worked, um, I, I, at the time I was at CNN, I spent my entire career in mainstream media, um, you know, the reach of mainstream media, I think, is um, is not in question. Um, the trust, intimacy, and relevance to people of color is very much in question. And so URL Media was born out of an effort to, in some ways, band together the small to achieve scale that um, might have a chance not just against the behemoths of the internet, which will uh, go through on our next slide and, and kind of how we were founded, but also with an eye towards sustainability of each of our um, individual ventures. Yeah, so if you can go to the next slide, we'll jump into who our partners are and what URL is really about. Um, right now, URL is uh, a network of eight independent um, media organizations that are all serving black and brown communities. And um, Mitra and, and, and my organization, WURD, 
and uh, epicenter of two of those eight. We also will be hearing in a minute from Palabra and the Haitian Times and Scalawag who are with us today. Um, but we also have a uh, documented TBN 24 and uh, scroll stack. And so these right now, that is the, the composition of the URL uh, media network. Our intention is to grow that um, significantly, both uh, geographically and, and nationally and also internationally. Um, and, and our goal is to uh, share content, share resources, as well as share revenues as a way to um, help us empower and strengthen these organizations that are doing already such amazing work in uh, in service of their communities, but also, um, you know, their, their, their challenges, their obstacles, their limitations sometimes to being independent. And we're thinking that if we can collaborate and combine our efforts, there are opportunities for us to um, do even more and, and to be leaders in this media space um, in addition to uh, serving authentically our audiences. I think it's also worth noting, just because it's kind of displayed before us, um, that on the right are mainstream media brands that are, these are these are just truly a list of brands. We are not working with those entities. So I just want to kind of clarify that. But I also think that um, the partnership with mainstream media in this process is worth underscoring that um, many of us are familiar, whether it's within our own outlets or working on the right side of the screen in mainstream media, the power of um, niche audiences and how stories that are in our communities, I can give you some examples as we go on in the discussion, um, are often you know, as early as six weeks, even months earlier to the mainstream media. And so the value proposition we offer um, is not just to the partners themselves in sharing content, but also uh, the opportunity down the road to syndicate that content to mainstream media, including some of the brands as outlined here. But again, very hypothetically, um, Sarah, I don't know if you want to talk about um, ad networks a little bit. I can pick that up too, but you're 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 a yeah. little more you're a little be, you're a little better at that. So. Well, if we keep going on, we, we'll talk about the the way that we envision um, the, the the structure of the the business uh, proposition. Yeah. So if we can go to the next slide, um, and and really the 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 idea, the 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 growth or the birth of this idea came right when we were looking at all of these racial justice protests and the, the global um, uprisings around systemic racism and um, white supremacy. And we recognize, I think everybody recognizes that the mainstream media is complicit in kind of perpetuating and uh, continuing the, the, um, the ways in which uh, anti-black racism and white supremacy uh, manifests in society. And so we um, we know and, and we know that a lot of newsrooms are struggling with diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And so we wanted to um, to kind of meet that moment head on with this idea of strengthening um, this this very powerful history and legacy of black and brown owned media organizations that have been, in the trenches doing the work for, for many, many years, but are often uh, not considered in the equation around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, you know, just creating autonomy and independence and centering our voices, our viewpoints, our communities is absolutely um, pivotal in the, the, the URL media concept. If you could go to the next slide. So Mitra, you, you take this. Yeah. So I think one thing to think about is um, the coalition that we represent, right? And um, you'll hear us describe this as a black and brown network. And I think it's important to note two things here. Um, the first is that we still center black voices. That's a very important part of our identity. We believe that if we solve for black America, everybody else benefits. We have countless examples of that historically. And as a media network, um, that felt a very important uh, guiding principle of our work. On the other hand, um, there is strength in numbers, partly because of the 
partners who we have. We've come out of the gate with more than, at least on Facebook, more than 4 million users already um, because of the scale that a TBN24 and a scroll stack represent in South Asia, just as an example. And so I think it's important to um, leverage the scale of some of our communities, um, not just in the United States as far as the growing demographic and the future of our audiences, but also the global population. 80% um, of the world is black or brown. It, does 80% of the world feel um, governed by uh, like black and brown centric media? Absolutely not. And I, I would say that, you know, we've heard from folks all around the world that um, that love this model and, and certainly do see global application. Um, I think also there's um, an element from the previous slide, but that also relates to systemic racism and how our newsrooms and their, our, their, our newsrooms were built in terms of staffing, but also what their missions were. And um, we can't, in, in some ways, the benefit of starting anew is that we get to rethink many of the practices that we take as um, that's just how journalism ethics work, or that's just how you do a police story and get to unravel the systemic racism that might have led to the production of journalism as we know it. I think that's one of the greatest opportunities um, before us. I am gonna um, ask Sarah to pick up on ownership because while I believe in it fervently, I feel like she's um, kind of emblematic of what, what it means to be a black owned business and, um, and thriving. Yeah, so you know, WURD is is um, you know we've been in the, in the game for almost twenty years. I've been running it for for ten years, and one of the things that that I have brought to a lot of these conversations uh, is that ownership absolutely matters in in um, how you structure your um, your content, how you structure your business priorities, how you um, own the the relationships that you have with your audiences and and how you um, can really uh, you know create a model that that is driven by service is driven by what the community actually needs and so I think that that um, this this notion of of ownership and uh, wealth creation is another piece uh, around the URL model you know it's um you know, we we talk a lot about business models, nonprofit, for profit, and it was very important to Mitra and I to uh, make URL of a for profit business model because we believe that um, there is a racial wealth gap that exists in this country, and we want to be able to um, meet that head on with the possibility of creating scalable um, revenue, scalable wealth that could actually make meaningful changes in kind of the the wealth dynamics and the the wealthy equation and so our we have we have a big vision we have big goals in terms of um, creating um, opportunities for not just for URL but for all of the entities that are a part of the network from a financial standpoint so the business model that we've we've talked about it a little bit, but um, you know the the I'll talk about the ad network because I think that that's the piece that Mitra um, referenced before. There's there's multiple ways that this that the URL network is is uh, structured from a business standpoint. But one of the the um, important and early opportunities that we've seen is through creating like an ad network. So um, we know that through the 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 moment that we're in, a lot of corporations are recognizing the importance of communicating directly with black and brown audiences. And so we believe that URL represents a, an amazing opportunity to reach audiences that are, are really uh, connected with each of our, our media entities. And But there's an opportunity to come in through one direction and reach many. And so um, we are looking at um, revenue shares of advertising. So an advertiser comes into the URL network, they get to reach, you know, the the black, the Latino, the the um, Asian communities through our partners. And there's an opportunity that each of our media organizations benefit 
from those revenues. And that is a really exciting and um, powerful model that is proving to be um, valuable and, um, and it's working. Do you want to talk about the other ones, Matt, Mitra? Yeah, I think we talked about syndication and we talked about um, platform optimization. Uh, the network membership, we really are only as powerful as our network, the content they produce, but also um, it, it's significant. I, I mentioned digital disruption earlier. Um, in some ways, it's not just that each partner represents, let's say, a different ethnic identity or a, a niche group to the partnership. Uh, we also have one live streamer, Sarah, is a radio station. Um, our partner at Documented has done some um, amazing work on WhatsApp and in, um, in uh, Spanish um, and is... I believe looking at Chinese and some other languages to reach communities in the places that they're at. And so um, what we hope is that it's not just um, this idea of, oh, we're a part of uh, you know a people of color network, which of course there's uh, strength in numbers, as I mentioned, but also that um, if your newsletter as Epicenter uh, was born, you can leverage TBN24's live stream um, community uh, to greater good, which I, I think on the last slide, I, I have an example on that one. And do you want to mention the network membership? Sure. So that's where um, um, I, this basically where I was going as far as um, uh, being able to access uh, content from one to many. And uh, we do see great growth in, you know, as Sarah has mentioned, we have eight inaugural members now. Um, there's a pretty aggressive plan though to get uh, bigger on that front so that you can almost splice and dice the network, which matters, I think, both for content, right? If you think about uh, running storylines as well as for the ad network. So each of these areas very much to integrate with each other. Next slide. Oh, that's so, us. <laughs> that's us. Yeah, we can we can go to the next one. I mean, we are impressive though, Sarah, but we don't need to dwell on it. We don't need to tell, we don't need to, to, to read our bios. And and this is just, this is our last slide. This is really just uh, some of our early wins. Um, we've gotten coverage in uh, a number of journalism publications as well as Axios and and um, you know the the sample of our newsletter that we we generate from URL which features the work of all of our member partners and um, also just really like highlighting this amazing work that 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 like Mitra is doing with Epicenter and vaccinations and and just the different ways that we're approaching. Um, the challenges that our communities are facing and meeting the moment with uh, solutions and with access. And, and so we're, we're super excited about the, the momentum that we have um, begun to, to create and um, are looking forward to accelerating that as the year, as the year continues to, to move on. Mitra, I don't know if you have a closing yeah. thought. I was just going to pick up on that, Sarah, that um, on, on the vaccination front, um, you know, I think all of us want to continue to stay ourselves, but be able to leverage uh, the power of amplification from each other. And so the vaccine initiative that Sarah is referring to, um, Epicenter launched as a newsletter to get through the pandemic. Once we hit January, the vaccines really were, um, it felt like the greatest need in our community. Um, and so we started to, you know, let people know we were available to help them book and it became word of mouth. But it's not until we leveraged the power of the URL media network that we really took off and were able to scale. There was almost a boomerang effect back from our niche community um, as a result of the URL um, network. So what do I mean by that? Um, we are in the epicenter of the epicenter. We're based in Jackson Heights, Corona, um, and Elmhurst is kind of the immediate community around us. Um, because of the work that Sarah's radio station has done with a doctor who's gotten a lot of attention recently, she was just on Good Morning America, um, Dr. Ayla Stanford, I um, had heard of this woman and heard her approach to both COVID testing as well as ultimately vaccines were not on kind of what we see a lot of is like celebrities getting vaccinated, but she really focused on word of mouth and the power of communities. 
And so it was in an interview that she did on Word where she talked about this that I really kind of leaned into that as the guiding principle of how Epicenter was going to, through word of mouth, spread vaccine awareness as well as the ability to get help from us to book. What did I do next? So I called up Habib Rahman, who founded TBN24, also a member of our network. And I said, um, could you let people know that we're offering this, right? There's a lot of Bangladeshis and Queens. And so um, he put it out on one of they, they live stream every night on their newscast. And he um, shared our flyer in Bengali and English. Uh, he offered an email address, a phone number, a link to us. And suddenly I started getting dozens and dozens of Bangladeshi taxi drivers reaching out, asking for help with vaccines. And, you know, his network goes all over the world, but I think it's important that it had to go all over the world for me to find Bangladeshis that don't know about Epicenter as a newsletter, just living blocks away from me. Um, the Haitian Times also has shared some of our stories and shared kind of how we've approached it in the process of us highlighting certain pharmacies and places to get vaccinated. We heard of a pair of Haitian pharmacists who've been trying to help their community. I called McElvey, who you'll hear from later, and said, would you guys do a story on this? And of course they did a story on this. Um, Documented has been grappling with many of the immigrants who are showing up at vaccine sites and being turned away because they don't have effective documentation. Their freelancer called me and asked for help um, getting some of their users on the path to getting vaccinated. Um, and the last example I'll mention is we got a call from Maryland saying there's a group of women um, in the Latina community who are doing something very similar to you. And so I called our partners at Palabra and I said, is this a story? And so they ended up doing a, a pretty long piece and a video on um, this initiative. And so none of this is um, accidental. And I think that's, and yet, you can kind of see the power of a network. And I didn't feel like I lost anything. If anything, think of how much we all gained by being able to tap into one media outlet that's pretty small um, in, our, in our efforts around just vaccines. And I do think that that model is certainly applicable to lots of other areas going forward. Excellent. So um, now we're gonna introduce some of our partners and um, the first one is Nancy San Martin. Um, she is a journalist and a contributor to Palabra. And we're gonna hear from you. Hi, Nancy. Hi. We'll you about the work at Palabra and um, how Palabra is speaking into this question of race and equity in the news and how we're serving our communities in, in very unique and special ways. Well, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be part of this uh, very important discussion. So I will start by saying that the issue of diversity, uh, equity and inclusion is not a new issue. Right. We've been we've all been uh, struggling with that, you know, for our for all of our careers, I would I would guess. And uh, I think what is new is what I would call um, a growing movement to actually do something about it. Um, at NAHJ, we've been, you know, uh, fighting for um, fair and accurate representation of our communities over the past three decades. And Palabra actually emerged um, as an idea uh, for, you know, how do we represent or help uh, broaden the voices and represent the communities that we serve, uh, particularly at a time when the industry uh, has been in such turmoil in terms of its own framework, right? And we saw so many um, layoffs and mergers and closures. And of course, that affected a lot of our uh, of our own uh, members uh, and journalists, and particularly the up and coming journalists um, in many newsrooms were, were the first to go. So Palabra was actually the idea of our executive director, um, Alberto Mendoza, to provide a platform that would serve freelancers so that they could actually do journalism and get paid for it. And uh, so it uh, kicked off, uh, it, we're fairly young in uh, 2019, and uh, it's growing in terms of the number of contributors. I myself have 
uh, contributed a couple stories. And, um, you know, having come from um, up the ranks as a reporter and then an editor, and then a manager, I got to say that going back to the basics of writing was pure joy. Um, and I think that the kind of stories that we're offering are are very representative of the communities. It's not just about, um, you know, the immigration issue, which is what you often see represented um, when it comes to mainstream media, but also about, you know, uh, profiles of people who are doing great things or uh, communities in need uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, activism, um, volunteer groups that are doing X, Y, or Z. These are the kinds of stories that that Palabra uh, is doing in in various formats, and we're also obviously multi-platform with with the video and the visuals. The other thing I would like to highlight is the fact that we recognize the importance of a community that is bilingual. So we don't speak. Uh, one language we speak uh, what I Spanglish um, and you will see that some of the stories are in Spanish as well and that's um, often not the uh, the result of a translation but rather uh, it comes from writers who uh, write in Spanish and so that also is something that I would say is unique in terms of uh, providing a platform for our Spanish language uh, journalists. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was the issue of, uh, that you touched on is the issue of, of money, right? At the end of the day, um, even though we are a nonprofit, I think what is happening with the various efforts is showcasing the fact that the communities that we serve also represent a um, smart business opportunity. Uh, in the case of the Hispanic population, we know that it's a, you know, a growing population. You look at the census; it's an emerging majority. So we have to uh, tap into that audience. We have to represent um, those communities uh, that we serve. Otherwise, they won't be. Our customers. I mean, that's in simple uh, the simple business model. If you don't provide a service, uh, they'll go elsewhere. And so, recognizing that that too is an important factor, um, I applaud the efforts uh, of my colleagues on this panel for recognizing that and serving that purpose as well. Um, I don't have a heck of a lot more to say uh, because I really do want to. Uh, provide plenty of, of uh, space here for dialogue. Um, so I'm going to end with that and uh, pass it back to our moderator. Great, thank you. Thank you, Nancy, that's awesome. Um, we're so excited to have Palabra uh, as a part of the, the URL media network because they are connecting so authentically with the, uh, the Latino community and um, and, and also empowering uh, journalists, uh, journalists of color. So that's, um, that's amazing. Uh, next up is Sierra Hinton. And Sierra is the executive director and publisher of Scalawag. And uh, Scalawag is, um, well, Sierra is gonna describe exactly what Scalawag is, but I think um, the way she's described it to me is it's a movement journalism um, uh, platform news uh, organization that is covering the South. So um, we are excited that Scalawag is a part of the URL Media Network. And um, tell us, Sierra, what this, this notion of race and equity in the news means to, to y'all in the, in the South. Thanks, Sarah. Um, you know, race, equity, um, and journalism in service of community um, is core to my work and the work of Scalawag. Um, and just so grateful um, to be a part of today's conversation and to to be a member of the URL network. Um, engagement journalism, solutions journalism, movement journalism, um, there are just so many ways that we've come to talk about journalism that centers communities, um, especially communities that have been um, and continue to be harmed, erased, or otherwise overlooked by this industry. 
Um, though a true racial reckoning has not come to news yet, uh, more and more journalists are rejecting objectivity and other tenets of white dominant culture that keep us from being in relationship with and serving all people. Um, the moving away from business as usual uh, and the rise of projects like URL, Press On, Media 2070, and newsrooms like MLK 50, Outlier Media, um, and of course, our fellow uh, URL network members um, is where I find hope. Um, I also find an immense hope in the transformation that my organization has undergone and the lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, Scalawag, as um, folks might know, um, began as a white-led quarterly print magazine with a subscription model. Um, today, we are a membership-driven, digital-first, Black, queer, and woman-led journalism and storytelling organization that works in solidarity with oppressed communities in the South to disrupt and shift the narratives that keep power and wealth in the hands of the few as we collectively pursue liberation. It's quite a from two, if I do say so myself. Um, but we didn't get here overnight. Um, there are many decisions and critical points in our organizational development that we can point to that led us to this current iteration of Scalawag. Um, but I just wanted to share three of the biggest pivots that got us here um, that I feel like other folks can learn from and implement in their own newsrooms to bring them closer to serving community, um, especially communities of color. Um, I want to start with Black and queer leadership. Uh, there's a long history in this country of transformational change coming from the leadership of Black and queer people. Scalawag is no exception. Um, and that's because those of us on the margins have a fuller understanding of what it will take to ensure that everyone is included and more importantly, everyone is free. Uh, the most marginalized person has everything that they need to live a whole, safe, liberated life. That to me is a meaningful, actionable definition of equity. Um, I have no doubt in my mind um, that when marginalized folks are given the resources and space to lead, we will see a shift in how this industry relates to oppressed people and communities. Um, the next thing that I would highlight is the uh, discontinuing our print product. Um, when Scalawag did an audience survey in 2018, um, we discovered that our audience was overwhelmingly white um, and that it skewed older. Uh, for as much as we loved it, the product that we were creating, um, a quarterly print magazine full of long reads, did not match the lives and habits of the audience we wanted to reach. Just as important, we couldn't even track the impact of the product we were creating, and we had no way of knowing if it was serving the people and communities we wanted to serve. So we killed it. Um, and freed up space and resources to produce products uh, that can not only track that we can not only track the impact of, um, but that center and target communities of color and oppressed communities from the very beginning. Um, lastly, we got really intentional about building relationships with community. Uh, the first step of our theory of change is right relationship. Um, when we say right relationship, we mean we are in generative reciprocal relationship with community organizers and movements. Um, our community trusts us to share stories, um, their stories, and as a source of information because of the relationships that we've built with them. We build relationships through our work with community rooted con contributors um, by amplifying and being in relationship with community and movement organizers um, and through our virtual and in-person events. Um, and of course, also through community driven reporting. Uh, no matter how you do it or what you call it, relationship building and community engagement must be foundational and an ongoing part of our work as journalists. Um, at Scalawag, we look forward to a blacker, browner, more equitable future um, for this industry and what that will mean for communities of color in the South and beyond. Um, and we're really grateful to be able to do this work with y'all uh, and to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sierra. We are um, happy to be in uh, in business with the with you and the, the Scalawag team as part of URL. Um, you guys are doing amazing work always. And our final uh, URL uh, partner represented today in this conversation is McElvey Neal. And McElvey is the managing editor of the Haitian Times. Hey, McElvey, how are you? 
We're excited to hear about the amazing work that you guys are doing at the Haitian Times. And um, yeah, speak into this question of race and equity and how you're uh, doing your journalism in service to your community. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you so much uh, for having me. This panel is just exceptional, and I commend you and Mitra for really making URL come to life. In many ways, I think our relationship with URL is really just a, a formalizing of um, the ways we've been working um, over time since inception um, 20 years ago at the Haitian Times. And so I'm just really grateful to be able to tap into all of the resources that you've made available and all of the partnerships and relationships we've been able to build just in the past several months. It's really amazing. Um, so just to step back a little bit and share um, just some, some basic information about the Haitian Times. It was founded back in 1999 um, by a former New York Times reporter, Gary Pierre Pierre, the original publisher, and he left it to be able to speak to the issues and experiences that Asian Americans like himself were experiencing across this country, right? So we started off as a print publication based in Brooklyn, and um, we've just, the amount, the reception that it got right in its founding was just incredible. I myself remember coming across the, the hard copy of the Haitian Times back in like 2001 or something like that. I was in college getting ready to graduate and um, getting ready to have my bachelor's in journalism. And I just came across this publication that had the Haitian Times, you know, scroll at the top. And the immediate feeling I had at the time being 20 or 21, however old I was, was just, it was like a really just moment of pride, like quiet pride to be able to say, oh my God, we have our own newspaper. I had no idea. Um, being raised in Brooklyn, born in Haiti, raised in Brooklyn, a lot of times as an immigrant, you know, you stick to your little community in your pocket, wherever you are. And so having a window to what the rest of the Haitians in New York, in Florida, in Boston were doing was just an amazing feeling. And so that's how I ended up joining the Haitian Times and kicking off my career there straight out of college. Along the way, I left for a while, went into mainstream um, news publications, worked there. I also moved into the corporate space to do corporate communications. And meanwhile, on a parallel track, the Haitian Times continued to evolve and it turned into a digital publication in 2012, um, solely digital. And so over those last like 15 to 17 years, we've seen the Haitian population grow to 1.1 million people across the US alone. And there are just so many more across the world. And so what we do is try to tell those stories of assimilation, acculturation that our community goes through across this country. And the way that we do that is by making sure that we practice quality journalism, where we are unique in the way that we tell those stories of our unique diaspora. And um, some of the reasons we're unique, as you may know, is because Haiti is primarily Creole speaking with some people who speak French and whatnot. So our language automatically sets us apart from a lot of immigrant groups that may be coming from the Caribbean. And so being able to tell our stories, being able to tell the stories of Haiti, not just from what you see in the headlines, but trying to go beyond the headlines to add nuance and authenticity and hearing more from the Haitians who are experiencing these stories is really um, how we have a lot of impact in terms of uplifting our voices and making sure that our experiences are told from our point of view instead of other people reporting in from the outside. In doing that, we've had the opportunity to make a lot of connections with people who are serving the community as community-based organizations, um, clergy, you know, healthcare workers, all of these folks that we need to be able to tell these stories also need us to be able to share information about what's going on with their groups 
And so it's always been a bit of um, a symbiotic relationship because you really need each other to be able to tell these stories in, a, in an authentic, rich way. And part of that is actually becoming a resource for the community, right? Where they come to you to ask you what's going on. A lot of times resources and services that may be available to people um, just aren't easily discoverable, right? So who do they turn to? They turn to the families and friends that they know, and they might call up the Haitian Times to find out, hey, I need to, <laughs> I need a Haitian actor for my movie. Do you know anyone? I need Haitian doctors to be part of this, you know, group um, we're putting together to address health inequities in the city. Do you know anyone, right? And so um, trying to help people navigate both within the community, educating them, helping them understand what's out there, what's available to them is one way we have impact. The other way is by being a resource for people outside of the community who want to link with us and understand um, things from a more contextual perspective. I would say the third piece that really defines um, our coverage in the Haitian times is how we are um, what we think of as the conscience of the community, right? Because at the same time, we're really keen on uplifting our voices and making sure we're heard and that we do have representation, right? That we have a record of what our lives have been like or are like as Haitian Americans in the US. At the same time, being reporters and journalists, you can't let people get away with whatever, right? That's part of the, the idea of holding people's feet to the fire accountability journalism, solutions journalism, whatever it's called, right? So it's part being a parent and being a conscience of the community, uh, making sure the officials who are elected, whether they're Haitian or not, are you know held to task for what it is they're responsible for providing to the community. And then likewise, calling out members of the community themselves when they're doing things that may be a little bit irresponsible. Um, things like holding, um, parties in the middle of COVID and not really following social distancing guidelines and all of that. So to bring it all together and to end, I would say when I think about, you know, URL, the words that come to mind are for uplift, you know, making sure you're educating your community, both your own community and the communities that you as, as Haitian Americans, in my example, are interacting with right? It's a two-way, you're like the middle person providing education to all these groups. The second piece I would say in terms of respect, right, the R in URL, I think is respecting the cultures that um, you cover, right? And that culture isn't just the ethnic part of your community, obviously language, race, ethnicity, all of it matters, but I think respecting the culture of, say, the local government that um, services your community, the schools, the hospitals, like understanding how things work and understanding how it could work for you and your community, or being able to understand like where there are gaps to try to help solve the problem, I think is really important. So approaching things from the, the lens of, you know, um, going into the story, I'm going to respect like where this person is coming from and what they're doing and allow them the space to share with me what they have so I can know how to represent it for my community. And then in terms of love, um, the last letter in URL, I think you really have to have a genuine affection for your community to be successful. You know, thinking of the community as like a, as just this like mass of people that don't have faces just really doesn't work. So in every story that I edit, certainly, I try to make sure that I have a face tied to that story, right? I think about my own brothers and sisters. I have six of them, so there's a lot. And I try to imagine how this might impact them and what they're going in their life, what they're going through in their lives, right? I try to think about, you know, my cousins, my mom, my, my sisters, like everyone that I might know to see how they may be experiencing what's happening. And so Mitra earlier, for example, talked about 
being able to um, share information about the vaccine sites, right? Like that was a huge problem. It would it took like two months, three, two and a half months to get um, just an appointment for vaccination in Flatbush, Brooklyn, one of the hardest hit areas of the pandemic. That should not have been the case. And so being able to share um, and partner and collaborate with people like Mitra, like Epicenter, URL, I think really does take, is um, a demonstration of the love you have for that community because you're showing the willingness to go out there and just bring this information to them. And um, lastly, from a business aspect, I would say the Haitian Times did start out as a print publication serving primarily Haitian American English speaking um, residents of the US. But now, as we've seen with um, what's happened in the past year, with the racial reckoning that this country is going through, we knew it was happening and we had covered these issues over time, obviously, but we've really seen a huge opportunity to take advantage of the fact that the powers that be institutions, foundations are listening and they're willing to provide support. And so we see things like um, the Google News Initiative coming out, right? Um, the Facebook Accelerator, all of these giant um, conglomerates, these media entities who are looking for our content and our ways of approaching the stories to do business. I think for us, that presents an opportunity to say, okay, how can we serve some of the members of our community that we weren't able to before because of a lack of resources. And so what we're looking at doing now for the next iteration of the Haitian Times, like our next, our ongoing evolution would be to expand our audience, try to service the people who are Creole speaking, a lot of them older who aren't able to consume information in English, and also to make sure that the younger generation um, coming up, the third and fourth generation Haitian Americans at this point, are able to still have a publication that they can point to and say, yes, you know, I'm Haitian American, this is my community, and the Haitian Times is one way that I demonstrate that. So. So much. Uh, Thanks so much, uh, McElvey. That was great uh, to learn more about the amazing work that the Haitian Times is doing. We're going to um, get ready to open it up to questions. I just want to underscore that um, even though uh, you know everyone made it sound kind of easy, this is really hard work um, to do this uh, this kind of community based journalism that really centers your communities um, at the heart is is um, is not easy to do on a day to day basis to make it work financially from a business standpoint. But um, we're excited that uh, we have assembled this incredible network of uh, organizations that are doing the work so well. And our goal with URL is just to amplify that work and help to create additional revenue generating opportunities so that they can continue to grow, expand and elevate. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. So we're going to get ready to open everything up to questions. We have quite a few questions from the audience. But before we go to the audience, um, you know, now that we're here live, you know, we, we actually taped that um, uh, presentation before the Derek Chauvin verdict was was delivered. And that was a, a major um, historic occurrence. And so um, and it, it definitely speaks into this question of race and equity in the news. And so I wanted to ask one question and any of you can can answer it um, before we go to the questions. But, um, you know, like like we we talked a lot. Each each uh, person who spoke in the video talked a lot about nuance and authenticity and connectivity and trust with our audiences. And I wanted to, to get from from you all. 
how you feel um, your outlets have covered the, um, the the Derek Chauvin verdict, but also we know that there have been multiple um, police killings since since uh, since that verdict, whether it's um, you know Micaiah Bryant or or um, Adam Toledo or Andrew Brown, and um, I'm just curious, and maybe I'll I'll punt it to you, Sierra, because um, I know there's a lot going on right now in North Carolina around this um, this killing of Andrew Brown, and I, I just want to know, like, what do you feel like you, like Scalawag or your outlet is bringing to this conversation that's unique and different, based on being independent, community based, and um, really audience centered? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, so. You know, we don't do breaking news. Um, we don't publish every day. Um, and we really uh, try to focus on, yes, like personal narratives, stories that are happening on the ground. Um, but we really try to focus on like systemic issues. So when we are talking about um, police killings, when we're talking about uh, police brutality, when we're talking about uh, protest, um, you know, we are talking about that through the lens of, uh, you know, what is happening across movements, uh, whether it's the movement to um, abolish uh, the carceral state, or uh, if it is like the movement uh, to make sure that like people of color are, are center, centered in, in media and our stories are centered, um, or whether we're talking about, um, you know, the injustice uh, that in the ways that in which like um, women, uh, particularly black women are often like overlooked um, or otherwise uh, just not given, their murders are not given the same type of coverage um, that we see uh, with other police killings. So um, for us, it really is just this focus on on bringing to light this larger systemic issues that come that are behind this, and to remind folks like this is not just um, this moment. Um, this is also connected to um, the slavery. This is connected to um, you know so many movements that have happened before this point. Um, and so that, you know, folks really have that understanding and that grounding and that deep historical context um, and can begin to unpack uh, not, not only how this moment is connected to past moments, but also how all of these systems of oppression are connected um, and continue to uh, keep uh, Black and Brown folks in particular, but really all of us oppressed. Mm. Does anyone else want to want to um, speak into that before we go to the audience questions? I'll just say one thing, Sarah, and this is actually partly a URL media initiative, but um, Epicenter has been um, chronicling the mayoral election here in New York City. And in the wake of the Derek Chauvin verdict, I do think um, even how voters um, will want a law and order candidate as it's often called feels like it's changing on a pretty regular basis so we've um leaned into that our reporter um uh, working on that had uh, the first part of a two-part series on what law enforcement means um, to New York City voters and goes a little bit deeper. To your point of all of us talking about nuance and authenticity, um, it feels like there's sort of this broad brush of like the law and order candidate and the progressive candidate. And um, he just dived into some themes within that. Um, and then just within the Asian community around stop Asian hate, I think it's been really intriguing to see that there's actually nuance in that debate where it's not instantly, oh, we need more policing in order to combat hate crimes. Um, and I'm just, you know, I, I think this is actually good news for a change. I'm definitely seeing and embracing within my own outlet um, a desire for nuance around these issues as opposed to kind of the typical binary we see on how we cover elections. Yeah, absolutely. Um, McElvey or Nancy, either yeah. one of you want to say anything? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say that in addition to obviously reporting on the actual verdict and getting community reactions, right? Um, because of where we are in New York, we were able to um, actually follow people who had made plans to gather 
at a particular um, train station, right? To just react whether the, the verdict was guilty or not guilty, right? And Haitians being Haitians, we're always everywhere with our flag and our drums. So I knew that would be something to shoot. And so we immediately sent reporters over there. But I think one of the more, um, even more um, authentic pieces that we ran was about um, how throughout this whole time, you know, there's a group of black psychologists who've been helping people like process all of this information um, starting with COVID through all the protests and all of the, the courtroom drama that happened because people need that outlet to be able to, you know, take care of their mental health. And so that's what we try to offer from a position of a solution or something else that's happening that's very important that may not get the information that it needs um, during, at, at any point. When you have moments like this where there's a big verdict and you know people are going to be attuned, it just made sense to also offer that as a contribution to remind people that this isn't just something that happens today and disappears. People in our communities are constantly daily going through the emotions and processing them. Yeah, absolutely. Nancy, any anything you wanna weigh in on? Uh, no, I mean, I, for Palabra, obviously it's not a daily. Um, you know, publication as well. So uh, our efforts are really in terms of elevating perspectives, uh, providing the perspectives in those voices, um, not only for this issue, but for other issues. Um, so in terms of, you know, breaking news, we too also don't really have the capacity to do that. But we always do find, try to find the voices who can offer the readers a different view uh, with authenticity. Mm hmm. Excellent. I know for us at WURD in Philadelphia, it's a black talk radio station. And um, we really similar to what McElvey, you were saying, we were really intentional about making sure that our um, team, our staff, our hosts, our our uh, media team were taking care of themselves because this is a lot. And so kind of with that same theme of URL, uplift, respect, and love, we have to uplift and re respect and love ourselves as well, because this is really grueling work when you're not just talking about it, you're also living it um, in, in many ways. And so um, we, we were definitely trying to be very intentional on the mental health care um, side of things as well, both for our community, but also for our, our team. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna open it up to some questions and um, I'll just go right from, from the top. Uh, this is from Mark and Mark, I'm probably gonna butcher your last name, Mark Peep, Peep, Peepsel, sorry. Um, so um, he wanted to see if uh, me or Mitra could speak or one of the speakers could discuss how network effects may work differently globally than in the US where a minority of white conservatives of, often seem to rule. Mitra, I'm gonna let you um, address that. What is the difference in terms of how a network would be constructed here in the States versus how it would look globally since the, the racial dynamics would likely be very different? I was muted, sorry. Um, I think we see certainly evidence of this. Um, and there's a few strands from that question that I'll pick up on. And when you say network, I wasn't sure if you meant media network or um, information network or journalistic network. So, so some of what I say is kind of lumping them together, um, admittedly, just so, just so you know that I'm aware I'm doing that. Um, so I think some of the forces are actually very similar. Um, my background uh, is, I, I, my parents are Indian immigrants. I've worked overseas in India. I was raised partly in Puerto Rico um, for my childhood. And so I do tend to have a global view of coverage and I'm on many, many WhatsApp groups where the spread of misinformation um, is quite rampant. And so the same forces, at least um, that I've seen of white nationalism in the US are certainly evident um, overseas. One of the challenges as in the US is that they're often aligned with authoritarian governments. I would say an even greater challenge overseas, and you saw this this week uh, with India and its reaction to COVID, is that the platforms have censored some of the criticism of the government and its COVID response. And so, um, 
what ends up happening is that on the platforms, which, you know, largely we've viewed platforms as attempts to democratize information, you're only getting one lens of information. And if you think about what we're seeing, again, what the U.S. is seeing from India, which is a government in collapse, a healthcare system in collapse, um, there's great fear over those voices in their totality not rising and being shared, literally shared um, on feeds. Um, one other thing I'll just mention, um, and, I, and if you have kind of follow-up to this, feel free to reach out because I'm, I'm hoping I'm addressing um, the gist of the question right. Um, Epicenter hosted a live stream with one of our URL partners earlier in the week, Squirrel Stack, and we actually had representatives from India, Peru, and Brazil on. And I share that because vaccine distribution, which the whole URL network has, you know, really gotten behind um, and you've already heard I couldn't have done anything at Epicenter without that network, has really become a global inequity issue. And so what was fascinating hearing these three countries and their perspective was the role of the networks you're describing and fringe groups within that are destabilizing when it comes to misinformation. Um, each of them have very, each of them have uh, governments kind of in flux in the case of Peru and India, both dealing with elections and how that's going to affect their response. Um, and so what happens when countries are destabilized, whether it's governments or COVID, or in the case of the ones I just mentioned, all of the above, these factions kind of see this as an opportunity to insert themselves and create even further destabilization. And uh, whether that's like misinformation around science and the vaccines, or if it's um, uh, just the desperation with people trying to, uh, you know, these are life or death decisions. Um, all three countries mentioned that as a significant concern. Great, great. I'm gonna take uh, the next question is from Laura Quintero. Um, she said, really great panel. That's uh, not the question, but thank you, Laura. Um, I just wanted to know, what are your recommendations for learning about and tapping the subjects and needs that really matter to the community you are covering. Um, I'm gonna ask you, Sierra, to take that one. Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, my greatest recommendation is to talk with people. Um, and I know that probably like seems simple, um, but it's not, um, you know, there's been a really big erosion um, of trust um, between media and uh, people and communities. Um, and so, you know, being able to have uh, a conversation with folks is not always as easy as we would like it to be. Um, and so, you know, with that recommendation, I say like showing up in community and showing up to spaces without an ask um, and without a need um, over and over again and really building deep, meaningful relationship uh, so you can do this through uh, events, both virtual and when it's safe. Um, you do this through forming like partnerships with uh, community organizations and folks within the community who already have uh, built that trust um, and are willing to uh, work with you to get you introduced to folks um, and get folks comfortable with you and the work that you're doing. Um, and you can partner um, with not only community organizations, but other media organizations that have already started to do this work uh, as well. Um, but that's that's what I would say. It always begins um, and ends with uh, relationship building um, and really getting to know folks um, before you need them as a source for your stories. Does anyone else want to address that? Bravo. I would just add, <laughs> Sarah, that um, yes, definitely find the specific space or a place that you go to often, you know, and become like the place where people can find you even if it's possible physically now with, you know, COVID um, vaccinations actually taking root and things reopening. The other thing I would say is because a lot of our publications cover communities that do not speak English as their primary language, you know, don't let the language piece be a barrier, right? Um, don't let the fact that you don't speak Haitian Creole or <laughs> Urdu, whatever it is, be the reason that 
you shy away from engaging with people because most of communication isn't verbal anyway. It's really in your your approach, your demeanor, and um, you know how you come at people, so to speak. So if language is a barrier, like figure out a way to get over that, even if it's by learning each other's words, like initial um, basic phrases, right, to communicate. But there's a lot more that can be said and shared without you having to be fluent in a particular language. So that's what I would add is to just not be shy about approaching groups that don't speak your language because then you're just further perpetuating their stories not being able to get out there. So you have to make that extra effort and just go for it. Excellent, thank you. This one is for you, Nancy. It's very specific. Um, does Palabra have a video reporter component where freelancers can contribute? The answer is yes. Um, they are seeking to do more of that. And I would say that your contact for Palabra is the managing editor, Ricardo Sandoval. Um, so you can reach out to him and it would be, I think the email is Ricardo Sandoval at nhj.org. And I'll confirm that. But um, yes, we are looking to do more uh, uh, visual storytelling in the form of video. And, and I just wanted to add in the last question because I think it's important is that um, it's sometimes often actually I found it's more important to listen rather mm -hmm. than asking questions. Mm -hmm. So wherever you're gonna go, whatever forum you're gonna participate on, spend a lot of time listening because you'll get a lot out of that um, experience. Excellent, excellent. Mitra, I'm coming to you. Um, what role can networks like URL play in helping to recruit, encourage, and train new journalists? That's from Mark Taylor Canfield. Um, yeah, recruitment and training Great. through URL. So URL is involved in all of those areas. I think we um, can break this down into um, two significant themes that I'm seeing. The first is the talent itself. And I think um, what all of us, not just mainstream newsrooms, but all of us even on this panel uh, who might have come of age in a certain way in a certain system uh, need to look at is the ground is shifting beneath our feet. And what I'm hearing from young journalists um, or even older journalists is that they don't want to have to sacrifice themselves in order to commit journalism. And for long times now, we have kind of asked people to leave pieces of themselves at the door in order to engage in journalism. And we have a population that is saying, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. Now, as an industry, we need to look at our own future and say, are we willing really for people not to be a part of our industry because we ask so much in return. We almost neuter um, themselves or their feelings, their opinions, their communities in order to be a part of this. That's one uh, big area that I'm increasingly hearing about. The second are newsrooms themselves. Um, we are in a moment where whether we're whether your newsroom is reopening or you still don't know what's going on, are we going back to work? Are we going to be in the newsroom? Is it July, September? Um, is it going to be remote for a little bit longer than that? I've I've heard different scenarios. Um, there is a reset taking place on how we um, retain and recruit talent. I mentioned retention as well because um, for many folks who contact us asking for help with a search the mind immediately goes to, you know, we need this type of person. And if you talk to people of color in newsrooms right now, there is a, an erasure they're feeling of their skills. Um, and, you know, they were there before George Floyd. And if suddenly you've woken up and gotten the diversity memo, and yet <laughs> you've had people in your newsroom for a long time that are not a part of that process or not a part of what you were contemplating, I can assure you that the new people coming in are not going to solve the problem that you have. And so I think retention um, is another theme that I'm encouraging newsrooms uh, to look at. And then the final thing, which I think all of us represent are just, um, you know, where are the non-traditional places that we, I mean, all of us, I think are, are doing that. And I have folks at Epicenter who say, well, I love what you're doing, but I don't want to give up 
this other startup I have. And I said, that's fine, right? A part of people being themselves is not just their ethnic identity. It might be, you know, other passions and purposes that they want to fulfill. So that's, those are significant changes in our industry, I think. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. And this one, um, thank you, Lolly Bowen. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, she writes, thank you for this wonderful presentation. All of you serve an audience that has been both overlooked and harmed by mainstream media and philanthropy. Historically, philanthropy has been less enthusiastic about supporting black and brown led media outlets that center communities and voices of historically marginalized people. Very true. Do you see that changing? How do you compel funders to invest in this important and prolific work that informs, but also forces a change in the way the broad mainstream media covers these communities? That's a big question. Um, who wants to Who wants to take a first bat? And we've got to keep so everybody can kind of uh, answer this. But let's uh, keep the keep the answers kind of tight. Um, I'll start with you, Sierra. <sighs> <laughs> um, I would like to think that it is changing. Um, I think that we have seen some evidence uh, to support that in the last several months. Um, and that is super exciting. Um, my pause is around whether or not that will continue, whether or not um, this is actually just a moment in time. So folks can say that they did something. Um, we will see uh, what I will just quickly add is that um, the other thing that I hope um, is that uh, as philanthropy begins to invest more and more in um, newsrooms led by and serving people of color, that uh, they don't try to shift those newsrooms to fit uh, white standards of success, um, that they uh, take time to actually understand um, how those newsrooms work um, and how they function and what their communities need um, and that metrics and outcomes are aligned to that. Excellent. Um, who wants to go next? I'll, I'll go with you, Nancy. Okay, so I, I would just say that the short answer is yes. I mean, I think that there is some change clearly from the funding that um, organizations such as uh, Palabra are receiving from, from uh, uh, philanthropy. Um, but I what what I wanted to add is that I agree that that we want to make sure it's not a moment in time. So it really is up to us, all of us, to seize the moment. You know, we can't accept it today and not demand it tomorrow. So it's incumbent on us to to make the work that much value, uh, you know, as valuable as we can, so that these institutions um, recognize uh, why it's important. Excellent, McElvey. Yeah, I think I'm optimistic about what we've been experiencing at the Haitian Times. Right now, we're working with um, a group on what's called the Listening and Sustainability Lab that's funded through the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund. And they're helping us think through, you know, what uh, our site could look like, how we expand our audiences and serve them. And it's a longer term relationship that's not just like, here's a check and go do what you want with it. It's more of a partnership where we're getting um, great insights and support from people who already work with black and brown organizations who understand where we're coming from. So we can come to a point where the metrics, right? Um, as Sierra said, make sense for our community and the work that we do. So for that, I'm optimistic. And Mitra. So I do wanna hear your answer on this too, Sarah. So I'll try to be brief. Um, I think, the funders have enormous power right now in forcing change uh, of certainly mainstream institutions. And I think they should uh, use that when it comes to many of the issues we've talked about. Um, I worry about the dichotomy between how we are treated as founders of color, people of color, uh, women of color. Um, what I've noticed is that people might have money for us, but it requires, let's say, extra training or mentorship. or So there's a lot of programs in addition to the money. And I understand that the money is trying to compensate for decades of inequity, but I don't see my white male counterparts having to go through extra boot camps to prove that 
they are worthy entrepreneurs. And so I would like to be taken seriously at the outset. I think that's just uh, one area that funders can just check themselves a little bit on what is the way you're engaging with us versus uh, my white male counterparts. Some of them are good friends of mine, I promise. That's why I know they don't have to go through the same things. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that it's not just philanthropy. We need to demand accountability from a business environment where the good businesses are supporting other good businesses. And um, we, you know, we are a for-profit company at URL Media. Epicenter is a for-profit company. We want advertising. We want, you know, banks and other companies that are trying to do the right thing by supporting us. It's not just charity, it's good business. And I think we want to get that narrative out too. Absolutely. Um, so so my, my response would be, um, I am encouraged. I've never seen, I've been a media entrepreneur in um, service of black communities um, for 30 years. And I have never seen a moment like this before where there is a, uh, a, a collective um, acknowledgement that black and brown uh, media, businesses, organizations need to be supported. And um, I've never heard serious conversations about reparations. Black people used to say, oh, we'll never get reparations. Stop talking about it. You know, so um, this is this is a, a different moment, I think. Um, however, I also I, I wasn't there, but I also know that Reconstruction was a moment of deep awakening and opportunity for Black people in uh, you know after slavery in the eighteen late eighteen hundreds, and we saw what the backlash. So this country toggles; they, it, it goes forward and back, forward and back. You know, Obama and Trump. So you know, we we have a a, a legacy of uh, two steps forward, one step back. And so um, while I am encouraged, I also recognize that it is incumbent upon all of us on this screen, all of uh, the allies in the community to keep the pressure on because it is um, there is deep sustained work that has to happen because this country has a long standing disdain for black and brown people. I mean, just to call a thing a thing. And um, if you want to uplift respect and love the, the people, then the money and the support follows. But if you have disdain for the people, it's easy for the money to get, get funny, you know, for to be <laughs> to be um, reduced and reapplied some other way if you don't have love for the people. And in this country, we know that there is a lack of love for black and brown people. And so it is our responsibility to show the business case, to show the, 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 um, the audience size and capacity and to just keep the pressure on funders, corporations, everyone, because it's not going to be, it's not going to be given. We've got to, Take it, and I'll end there. Great, thank you all so so much. This was really incredible, and I really appreciate your candor and just hearing about all the important work that you're each doing and that the URL Media Network is doing for Black and Brown media organizations and the communities they serve. Um, I think mainstream media outlets could learn a lot from everything you said here, so I hope newsroom leaders and funders and others alike will um, watch the replay of this session and glean insights from it. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Um, to those of you in the audience, I want to remind you that this panel was streamed onto YouTube in English and Spanish, so you will be able to find a recording of it there on our ISOJ YouTube page. Um, and right now we have a little bit of a break, so we hope that you will take this time to join our Wonder Room, where you can continue the conversation um, that this panel sparked. So you can meet with other isagers and speakers in that Wonder Room, and we'll post a link in the chat. And then you can also check out our Spotify playlist, which features some fun Austin tunes. Uh, so if you just need a little bit of a breather and want to listen to some music and relax, check out that playlist and you can do so there. Um, and then our next panel is going to be our final panel of ISOJ, which is hard to believe. Um, it is going to be our second research panel, uh, and it's titled Challenging the Status Quo, New Pathways to Understanding News Audiences Today. 
So again, that will be at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, and we hope to see you there. Thank you.